While schools often touch on the brutality and inhumanity of this institution, many shocking facts about the end of slavery are often left out of the curriculum. These untold stories shed light on the complexities, struggles, and injustices that mark the abolition of slavery. Let's talk about it all in today's video. So for starters, where does education fit into the discussion of slavery? The answer is, well, very little. The SPLC study revealed that the states do not have rigorous enough curriculum standards in place. The panel led by Jeffries found that after reviewing 15 sets of state standards, the vast majority fail to lay out meaningful requirements for learning about slavery, about the lives of the millions of enslaved people, or about how their labor was essential to the American economy. The review did not cover Indiana's requirements. However, they are similar to many others around the country in that they are general, non-specific, and give a lot of discretion to local school districts, classroom instructors, and the like. There are only a handful of situations between fourth grade and high school where slavery is explicitly mentioned in Indiana's academic requirements. That doesn't imply these topics are ignored in the classroom. Teachers' approaches to discussing slavery and the extent to which they do so can vary greatly from one school district to the next. Even amongst classes, there may be differences. It can be very challenging to learn what students are truly learning about slavery in the classroom. Because of the delicate nature of the subject matter, it was initially challenging to locate schools willing to take part in this tale. Only two of the 10 local schools and school districts contacted by IndyStar were willing to let reporters and photographers into their classrooms. As a result, many classroom instructors use resources outside of the classroom, including digital tools, primary papers from the era, and other sources. This makes it more difficult to assess the effectiveness of education programs. Simply reading a book might not unveil the entire truth. The SPLC study reveals that numerous mainstream textbooks skip over vital details regarding slavery and those enslaved. But what's even more alarming? The rampant racism and sexism lurking in the shadows of Indianapolis public schools. Brace yourself. As we journey further, you'll be exposed to unsettling revelations that many have tried to sweep under the rug. There are online materials available from the Indiana Department of Education, but it's not apparent how popular they are. Three years ago, the state of Indiana released a movie to Vimeo about Mary Bateman Clark, a slave who successfully sued to eliminate indentured servitude in the state of Indiana. Only 44 times hath it been played. When we were 13, we learned for the first time that slaves were being taken over the Atlantic. Indianapolis public schools still rely on textbooks. For instruction, the books are written with a broad audience in mind. Therefore, they tend to reflect the norms and politics of the largest states. Eric Hege, an expert in curriculum and instruction for foreign languages and social studies, has warned that things can get watered down. To illustrate the plight of Africans kidnapped and sold into slavery in Nigeria as children, Nick Sargent had his seventh graders at Northwest Middle School read passages from the works of Olauda Equiano. He was taken as a slave to the Americas and eventually purchased his freedom. When asked why he didn't try to sugarcoat history for them, Sargent replied, I'm really big on not sugarcoating history for them. Many attempts have been made to present historical events in a more positive light. However, this does a disservice to the subject. Sargent assigns writing assignments based on Ikiano's life to his seventh grade social studies students. Many of his students are learning about the shipping component of the transatlantic slave trade for the first time from him. Estefany Potts, 13, stated every other slave history thing I've learned is mainly on land. This is the first time something like this has happened after learning that someone is on a boat. The legacy of slavery is felt today. Professor of Curriculum and Instruction at Indiana University Keith Barton argues that the methods used to educate about slavery are perhaps more problematic than a lack of materials. Barton argued that students are taught to view slavery as a moral failing of people rather than as a system whose effects are still felt by African Americans today. Barton argued that educators sometimes lacked an adequate grasp of slavery. In some cases, people may be misinformed because discussing the truth is uncomfortable. Barton argued that the lesson would be more problematic if it avoided discussing the lingering effects of slavery and institutional racism. He said that doing so would call attention to how whites continue to benefit from the legacy of slavery. That's a tough problem to solve. Both educators and the general public will find it difficult to accept. As one person put it, it brings up some very uncomfortable issues for people. 
In the Spelsee survey, an unnamed teacher said, it's difficult as a white teacher to majority non-white students to explain that white people benefited significantly at the very real expense of black people. This unease is also being felt in the classroom, which is still dominated by white teachers. Although the demographics of American students are rapidly changing, most kids are now non-white, the same cannot be said for their teachers. According to the most recent data from the National Center for Education Statistics, the latest statistics show that white teachers make up more than 80 of the profession. According to the SPLC's analysis, many educators are motivated to educate their children about slavery but are held back by a lack of resources and by their fears. As one participant put it, there's this sense of, how do we w what it? We're doing it wrong. What if people misunderstand it? As Jeffries put it, he emphasized that this was not an excuse but rather an explanation for part of the resistance racism and sexism in Indianapolis public schools. The topic may seem especially uncomfortable and pressing given the region's history of racism in the classroom and some recent high-profile incidents of racist behavior. Schools in Indianapolis and its suburbs are highly segregated, as are those in many other American cities. Schools were not included in the 1970 Municipal Services merger between the city and county. Beezing between the Indianapolis public schools in the city center and the surrounding township districts was ordered by the courts after that decision was deemed discriminatory by the courts a year later. By the time busing began a decade later, enrollment ITS had already plummeted dramatically. The district student body shrank from over 100,000 at the beginning of the 1970s to about 30,000 in 2010. Today, black and Hispanic children make up about 75 of IPS's student body and the majority of IPS pupils are low-income enough to qualify for free or reduced-price meals. The families who fled IPS didn't simply relocate to the suburbs. Over several decades, affluent white families began relocating to the county's suburban areas. Therefore, it wouldn't help much if the county's school systems merged for the sake of integration or reinstated, abusing which had stopped in 2016. Township schools have become increasingly diversified as IPS has shrunk in size. However, the affluent suburbs of the Donut counties outside the city are the antithesis of IPs. The student body of Hamilton Southeastern Schools, where a racial uproar arose in September when a photo of a kid dressed in blackface was uploaded online, is nearly 75 white. It is located in a county to the north of Indianapolis, an affluent suburb where many of the city's high-income professionals call home. About eight months before the photo was shared, the district had appointed an equality and inclusion officer who is now leading the training of educators. District spokeswoman Emily Abbotts has stated that the majority of teachers will complete the program this academic year. Last spring, the district also began holding periodic public dialogues about race and how to unite the community. There have been problems involving racism and intolerance in several other suburban districts as well. Noblesville High School, in the district that includes Hamilton Southeastern, had a racially tinged shooting threat discovered in a toilet in the previous November. Zeonsville High School students were pictured in a social media post last month giving the Nazi salute. And just a year ago, the principal of a Southside private Catholic high school was criticized for using the N-word in front of his students. He explained that he used the word while describing other terms that are not allowed on campus and offered his apologies. According to Jeffries, these racist occurrences are likely exacerbated by the inadequate teaching of topics like enslavement, civil rights, and African-American history. It might be possible to put a stop to it with better education. The majority of educators have an interest in doing so. According to SPLC studies, they require more robust educational programs together with stronger administrative backing and improved resources.